Hello, welcome back to the Hope to Hope Conference. This is session number two. I am Kim White with the My Sexy Business team, and I'm here with the famous Connie Myers. Miss <laughs> Connie, I am so honored that you are with me today, too. Uh, you know I love doing this with you. So. I know. We have <laughs> such a good time. We just stayed in trouble. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and I'm super excited about who we have oh, on in this too. session. This is the third, um, the third amigo in this party, <laughs> and that's Miss Cheryl Jennings. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Thank and you I was, for coming. I was with just your princess. Kim, <laughs> but I thought I was a princess too, and now I found that I'm not. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> being an amigo. <laughs> That's not true. We're the three princess amigos. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, we have we a lot of fun. <laughs> well, Miss Cheryl is. She's got all kinds of things going on in her world, and I just want to preface it by saying she is one of the strongest women I know on the planet because she's been through so much in her lifetime. Um, but one of the things that she does right now is she's she's a radio host. She is a best-selling author. author. She is a speaker. She's a... She's just a powerhouse. I just keep going back to that word with all the speakers, but she is a powerful, powerful um, advocate for caregivers, for people who are, you know, struggling with people understanding because, you know, caregivers a lot of times are isolated. And she has been the voice of hope for those people that are so isolated and struggling with special needs or elder care or you can go on and on and on. This woman is this woman is somebody to be friends with. That's what it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, it's, and it's something it's something that is so desperately needed because more and more there's there's more caregivers out there that are that are needing to take care of whether it's their parents or their children or or you know friends or whatever and it, I, I think it's almost like a forgotten group of people mm -hmm. um, that don't really, they don't have a way of having a voice because they're so busy taking care of someone else. So Cheryl, I really, I really admire everything you do and all the things, all, all the radio stuff you do to try to support others. It's, it's really amazing. Uh oh, where'd she go? Oh, I think we lost her for a second. She'll be right back. I know her. <laughs> <laughs> She will definitely find her way back on. But, you know, Cheryl is, she's got a huge, huge, huge following on her radio broadcast. She is. The information she gives yes. on that is so incredibly valuable yes. for anybody that's in a caregiver situation. And, and it's very broad based. It's not like it's in mm -hmm. one specific type of caregiving. It's yeah. it's anybody that really is involved in any kind of caregiving at all. And yes. and she comes from a personal it comes with personal experience. So yes. everything that Cheryl talks about, she knows firsthand what she's talking about. And you know, just so you understand how amazing she is, she's doing this broadcast from um, a place because she is she is actually with her son who is a special needs and he has had several surgeries. He's, I mean, he did not have a very good um, prognosis. He, they are struggled through a lot of things and she still is faithful to be good to everybody around her. She was telling us before we started about some of the people that she was talking to at the hospital. And I just, I can't tell you, I can't tell you enough about how much she impacts people. Cheryl, no, you've got to get back in the lobby. She's asking if she's on. <laughs> you you are on watching, but we need you on talking. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to point out, this is like a, this is a um, princess problem. We we are princesses, and this is one of the problems that we have is technology. We just struggle our way through it, but you know what? We're still going to show up. That's right. That's <laughs> we're right. Still gonna, we're still going to work our way through it. She will get back on. I know that she will She will figure it out. 
Cheryl, if you can hear me, just go back into the link again and come come back in and we'll get you put back on. But while she's off, I'm going to talk about her. Yeah, let's, let's do that. <laughs> let's just talk about it. Um, she is, you know, she has asked, she's been asked to speak all over the world. And she has dealt with people who have um, had loss or, or are grieving. She's had um, opportunity to speak to, I don't even know how many, how many tens of thousands of people she speaks to just on a monthly basis. She's got, she's got just an incredible following of people who well, rely on her. Oh, absolutely. I, I was just going to say, I mean, a, a, a lot of the people that listen to her radio show come back, all, I mean, they come back week after week after week and listen to what she has to say and, and the guests that she has on that really, um, it really impacts a lot of people's lives. And I love some of the questions sometimes she gets asked on the radio show mm -hmm. um, because they're questions that like a lot of people have and don't have anyone to, to ask of. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really the service that she's providing is really critical. Um, I have a friend, Mary, who is a RN and she's semi-retired and she goes out, she does home nursing. And the thing that she's found is that, especially with the elderly, there are so many people out there that don't have caregivers. And and the ones that do have caregivers, they're under a lot of stress yes. and, and don't know what to do or where to go. Yes. They don't realize that there is support out there for people. And it really does, I mean, so what she's doing is really invaluable for people whatever your situation is. Well, and she's so well connected because she has people come on and, and they, they speak on a certain topic each week on her radio program. And she's addressed, you know, um, autism, which is such a growing thing right now. She's addressed uh, Alzheimer's. She just, she has addressed all so many different the things full spectrum. And she has all these experts come on. And honestly, she, she gets tickled at me, but she she's a princess, but she's also an expert at being a caregiver. She's also an expert at being we're talking about you. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm well, really back. challenged with this because it was my internet that just dropped me. So <laughs> well, being, and you know being what? In a, I, go ahead. I would well, I was explaining to them that you are not you are not in a usual situation. You're not in your office. You are at you know a place because you're with your son and Blake is you know Blake is struggling and you and Monty are staying with him. So I mean I, we explain that because I, I want people to know that we might drop you five times, but I know you you'll get back on with it. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually I think day thirty six. It may be 35, but it's it's one of those. We've been away from home, having to manage to just stay in, uh, well, three different hospitals now, going through several surgeries. And I'm very grateful that he's on the road to recovery now because, you know, the, it's involved a lot. But, Kim, I just want to mention here that one thing we were talking about earlier is how grateful I am that God has placed us in the place that we needed to be. And we started out in Sherman because we have caregivers that live here that help us take care of Blake. And they're like our own kids to us. And that we're all family, and that's a unique situation to have. But when he started out, his surgery did not go well. Found out that his stomach was attached to his heart, and the doctor said, I can't do that because one little prick in the wrong place, he'd be gone in 30 seconds. And so we've had a lot to go through with um, thinking he wasn't going to make it several times. But when they decided they, he had to have a third surgery, the doctor in this town that could have done it said no. And that no opened the door for him to be sent down to Baylor Medical down at the heart of Dallas. And we actually had doctors who do heart and lung transplants doing the mm -hmm. surgery on Blake. And I just can't be any more grateful than I am that God has taken care of something we didn't know. And another good thing about all of this, I know it's been so hard on his little body. But for those that don't know, he has cerebral palsy. 
He's 47. He's 5'8", and he got down to 90 pounds. And he lost every bit of his body fat, but nobody knew why until the surgery. And his stomach had just twisted at the bottom of the esophagus to attach to the stomach, I mean, to the heart. So they were going, I don't know how he lived this far. So anyway, now that he's been remade inside and his stomach has now become a stomach again, they are, are opening up a way that as soon as he's had time to heal inside, he will be able to eat again. And the feeding tube we thought was going to be permanent does not have to be permanent if he can get enough nutrition by feeding himself again. So, you know, that's another thing. We never never thought that this would happen. We knew when we started that things could go bad for him because they did before. And it was just, it's one of those things that you you say, I'm never going to do this again. And yet you get to a point where you have no choice, that that choice has to be, I have to allow it anyway. And you just trust in God to help you through it because there's nothing you can do and everything is totally out of your control. So anyway, I'm grateful. I'm glad to be here with you and Connie. And I wish I was sitting there on the same couch with you, but since we're not, we're a twist. <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl is like our our princess amigo. She is. We are three peas in a pod. <laughs> I am grateful for not only like our professional relationship, but I'm so grateful that you are our friend. Yes, Thank because you. you are a you're an amazing woman. You're an amazing inspiration. You are, you know, you are just a blessing to everyone around you, and have been. Forever. <laughs> oh my goodness. You haven't known me that long. <laughs> well, it's been almost forever. <laughs> well, thank you. That's sweet. And I don't know what was said before I got on. So just ask me some questions and let me not repeat what you've already said. And well, we were just we were just talking about all of the good you've done for other caregivers and stuff. And my question was going to be. Um, what are some tips that you can give to someone that's finding themselves uh, for the first time being in a position of having to become a caregiver, um, whether it's, it, it really doesn't matter what the situation is, but what are some tips when you first start out realizing that you're, this is going to be a long-term caregiving situation? Well, let me give you several tips here because I learned a lot of things the hard way. There were no people out there saying, take care of yourself or here's where you go for any help at all. There, there was just nothing available when I was a young mom having a son that had problems that we didn't get diagnosed till he was 14 months old. And I was almost over the edge of not being able to deal with crying. But what I would say is, first of all, you are not alone. 43.5 million people were home alone last year caring for someone without pay. Now, we need to change that. We need to be able to help the families going through this because it, help, it takes a toll on your body, on your spirit, on your emotions, how you feel about everything, but it also takes a huge toll on your finances. And I interviewed one man that helps with the cerebral palsy organization and here's a, just a little bird's eye view. He said that it takes about $5 million, anywhere from three to $5 million, to raise a child from birth to death that has cerebral palsy. And I thought, oh, no wonder we were always broke because we never had any money. But every penny we made was not enough to take care of his care. From the very beginning, it cost more than we made. So the first thing I would say is, since you know you're not alone, you've got to find someone who's going through what you've got or has gone through what you're going through now. And you do that in several ways. First of all, you may personally know someone that is caring for a loved one, but it may be that they're caring for a parent and you're caring for a child and you don't think that you have anything in common. You do. A caregiver is a caregiver. And I started a group called the Overlooked Caregiver because so many times 
the person we're caring for will be cared for by many people, but you, the caregiver, are responsible for taking care of your own health so that you can take care of that person. But I've seen so many people pass away before the one they were caring for because Mm -hmm. it does take a toll on you. So that's my first tip is learning to take care of yourself by finding a group. If you cannot find a support group, let me tell you, you connect with me. I will help you find a support group because they're out there and I'm trying to just learn my way around of all the support groups that are out there that I knew nothing about. And I knew that there were things that I had to fight for from the very beginning. And one of the biggest tips I can tell you is to be strong in your voice. You may not have much else going for you, but your loved one needs your voice. It could be you have a child that can't speak, as mine is. He's 47, but he he can't communicate well. They can try to answer a yes or no, but they have a hard time distinguishing the difference. But he has to have someone to speak up for him, to say he's in pain. We need medicine or we may not, we're having an issue we need help with. Or it may be that you're trying to find equipment. And I can tell you, I have fought years for equipment. And that's not the best way to have to do it, but I won't give up. I've even gotten the doctors that we've been using for surgeries lately to help me write the company that is giving us a hard time getting his wheelchair fixed. And if you are having that struggle, it would help others for them to know who gives you trouble. Try to find some other way than that company to do that would be like a cerebral palsy institute, an autism group, whatever your problem is. And when you get to elder care, there are many different things, but there's a lot for Alzheimer's and dementia problems. But also, they need your voice if you are in a situation like we've been lately where he's been in a hospital setting to make sure that the caregivers who are paid caregivers do their best job for your loved one. Because sometimes they're wonderful and you absolutely love those people that treat them with goodness and kindness and with respect and courteousness. But you will get one once in a while who come in that's rough, tough, doesn't understand who they're dealing with, that they can't communicate very well. They treat them as if they're a piece of luggage laying on a bed, flip them over, turn on lights, yank their body parts around or whatever. And you need to be there to say, I'm not going to tolerate that. And if they are even like we went through recently, a hospitalist who just started talking about death in front of our son, who understood what was being said. And she was saying things like, you've got to sign this DNR because he may die or his heart may stop. And we were just panic mode thinking we haven't talked about that but we don't want you talking about that in front of him. And he gets wide-eyed listening to everything that's said. And then she says, look at him. He has no quality of life. And at that point, one of our caregivers jumped up and said, wait, wait, wait. He has quality of life. He's lived with my home for five years. I've been taking care of him because we are no longer able to lift him. But, They are wonderful, but he just jumped up and said, wait, you don't talk about that in here. Let's get out of this room. And we watched as our son's eyes followed us all out of the room, knowing he understood what was happening. And he saw us falling apart in the hallway, crying, because it's heartbreaking when people are not courteous and they're not considerate of the patient. So learn to speak up. We did. We reported what happened. That person was never able to come back into the room where we were the rest of the time that he was in ICU. You have to do that because it's not fair to your loved one to let things be said or done that is harmful to them and they are powerless to stop. But on a positive note, 
you have the opportunity to draw in the people who are knowledgeable about what you need. We've had wonderful social workers who've come in. They tell us things like where we can go stay for a cheaper price while our child is in ICU. They might help us find out where to get better equipment or to find out what he needs, how to go around what we've already had to go through and say, oh, no, we can help you. We can get that easier for you. They can help you to discover what is available in your own local community, even though they're not there. They can connect you to people who are in your local community that you may need to know. And so be powerful in your voice. Be strong in knowing you may not be able to physically do everything a child needs, but you can definitely use your voice to make sure that those needs are taken care of. And that's why I'm such an advocate for caregivers who feel alone, who feel isolated because many times, and this is, this is a struggle many other people have too, but many times if a caregiver were to say to you and you say, how are you doing? And they go, oh, I'm having a really hard day. I don't know if I can do this anymore. They're going to walk away thinking, oh, what do they think of me? Oh, I've just told them how I really feel. What if they don't like me anymore? And what if they don't come around anymore? Did I say something I shouldn't have? Are they going to start talking about? It looks like Cheryl is frozen. Um, if you can still hear her, keep listening. If if she does not, she there you are. Okay. okay. You got you got frozen for just a minute. It's okay. okay. That's okay. Well, thanks for telling me because I can't tell that. It's showing me on live, so I don't know that. <laughs> but what I was going to say is, as just wonderful human beings that we are, and I believe we are, we're givers, and people that are listening to this are givers. They're not mm -hmm. out there to take from the world. They're out there to say, what can I do to help somebody else? But be vulnerable in the issues that you are going through so that you can connect to people who are needing you in a very bad way. And I'll give you a for instance. Um, yesterday morning, here where I'm staying, we have a little kitchen that we can mm -hmm. use. And I went to get some coffee to leave and go relieve my husband who had been up all night with our son. And when I did, am I frozen again? Am I frozen again? Did I freeze? <laughs> I guess I froze. We, we I are, guess I froze. We are delayed, I think, in hearing what you're saying. I don't, I think you can hear us, Cheryl, but we can't. We can't hear you again. And I know it's an internet issue. Um, and I've actually got my uh, hotspot on my phone. So it, I thought it would keep a good connection. Keep hanging in there, guys, if you're listening. Because it's definitely worth hanging on and, and hearing what she has to say. It's, it's difficult when you're out and you're... Um, some place where internet is not stable and a lot of times the places that you stay in hotels or yeah just a lot of internet is not stable so she right. she is trying to get it worked out um we can see her but it's frozen oh. so let me let me take her down for just a second just stay on cheryl if you can hear me Okay. I'm going to take you down and try to put you back up and see if that will help. Hello. Can you hear us, Cheryl? I can. Can you hear me this time? <laughs> okay. I think we've lost her again. If you can hear me, Cheryl, if you'll log off and log back in, you may be able to get a more stable connection. 
you know, when you're using technology, it's bittersweet because technology is definitely amazing and it's something that we need. But at the same time, it can be it can be like hard for it can be hard for us to know if if we're all connected. Are you back, Miss Cheryl? I'm back. <laughs> Funny thing <laughs> is, it tells me the whole time I was live. I do not well, get any. You may have been. We just oh, can't my goodness. tell. Okay. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I'll try to go back just a minute. I was going to say that one of the things that happens in life is that we tend to wear masks. We don't want people to know us very well because we're afraid. If you knew what I really thought, how I really felt, you wouldn't love me anymore. And that's not true. What we need to be is more open to saying, oh, I felt that way too. Or to share, you know, if you're having a difficult day, feel free to call me. You may not have a hard day, but there are days that I just had a really hard struggle being a caregiver. And it's okay if you want to call and just talk. I won't tell what you're saying. And that's important. Keep confidences. You don't go spread everything that somebody tells you. But also just to know that somebody is out there. And let me just tell you, you don't have to meet them in person. I have several people that are writing me all the time, checking on me, making sure that I'm taking care of myself while we've been gone from home so long. And they send me updates all the time, almost every day. How are you? How's Blake? What's going on? Tell me what's happening. And I've never met them personally, but they are caregivers. And they understand the journey that I'm on. And they feel for me with the heartache and the times that things have not looked good. And then they're happy and rejoice with me when things are looking brighter. And so if you don't have that support, you're missing a huge leg of a chair because that's what helps support your chair that you're sitting on is all of that support group. So even if it's online and I'm telling you, I've got some ways for you to connect. If you go to Cheryl Jennings.com, www.cherylJennings.com, you can actually download a PDF for free that will give you an insight to the problems, top 10 problems that families face when they're caregiving, and I wrote it in connection with special needs children, but guess what? Those are some of the same problems I faced taking care of my mother. And my mom awesome. just passed away in about a month and a half ago. And so I've dealt with it on all ends, parents, grandparents, and a child. All of We've been married 51 years, and we've had like 47 of those years. And I can tell you that it's stressful on families, but what can happen is that it can make you closer to the person that you're sharing that burden with. Because if you can learn to talk about it, and this is something really important here, if you are a parent, please, please, please reach out for some help because communication breaks down so fast when you have a child with disabilities, and 90% of families will end in divorce. I don't think it's necessary. A lot of it is that when we are going through grief, we grieve in different ways. And if I'm a woman and my husband gets up and he goes to work, I may sit there going, well, he doesn't feel bad like I do, or he wouldn't go to work. And he's thinking, i got to go to work to support the family. And he's got to just go on with life. But you see how we can relate to each other in a different way and feel like they don't understand me. And it's just the differences. So if you can talk about it and understand, you're both grieving. It's such an important thing. Connie, what were you going to say? What I was going to say is um, in a, one of the people I interviewed for Crystalline Moments, they had lost uh, both of their children. And they managed to... They married. Uh, they were. It was. It was t ten years apart, and oh, they wow. met they together because they recognized. And and the very situation that you were talking about was exactly what happened in the beginning. She didn't understand why her husband had to go to work, and at the same time, her husband had to go to work just to try to cope. Um, and they right. when they went to counseling, they found out that 
everybody grieves differently and that it's very important that you allow that person to grieve the way that they need to grieve and and grief happens whether somebody's passed or not you grieve the fact that your that your child isn't well you grieve the fact that you're in this situation with all kinds of grief that goes on yes. um, another piece of advice that my uh, you, you never know where those friends are going to come from so I really like right. that, uh, being able to um, reach out to people and and you may not have ever met them when I realized that Tom was sick and we realized how bad he was, I had I sent out an email and people that I barely knew reached out to me and one woman in particular was instrumental in me being able to cope with the fact that Tom was dying. And she gave me some incredible advice. One of the things she said, and I think anybody that's going through this, if you can each day find one thing to laugh about. Right to smile about and and sometimes when Tom was sick we were, we would we, it was at his expense because it was but um and, and we both laughed about it but you know she, I think that was probably one of the best pieces of advice and I'm sure that's very true if you're a caregiver trying to find something to get, put a little joy in your life absolutely and there are funny things that happen and you do need to laugh you need to laugh at yourself Laugh when things don't go quite right and you've made a big boo-boo and just admit it and go on. Just try to make things easier by staying a little bit lighter and not make everything a heavy conversation, you know, because there's a lot of heaviness associated with caregiving and your concerns for that person and whether they're getting well or if you've got the right doctor or if the doctor understands you, if they they're taking the right medicine, if they're getting the right therapy. There's so many things that are involved in it that can be heavy. So that's where finding a little bit to laugh about is fun. And for me, I have found a lot of joy in watching the Facebook with my grandchildren and laughing about things that they say. But try to make it easier for the person you're caring for. Don't make everything just, okay, I'll go in and I'll change you, but then I'm going back and be away from you make it where you can sit down and talk or read to them, you know, talk, mm -hmm. sing to them. I know when Blake was so sick and he could not even open his eyes, I stood over his bed so much of the time, just gently stroking his forehead and singing songs to him. Not that my voice was important, but it was my, it was his mother's voice and he Absolutely. knew that I was there. And, you know, I just think that, I could watch him, how he would relax and go to sleep. And there have been times, you know, one of the mm -hmm. most unusual things, now our son hardly communicates very much, right? One of the days was one of the hardest days that I'd had, and I'd gone out crying to come back in, and he could tell that I had been crying. When he looked over out of his bed, for the first time in his life, he asked me a question. I never remember him asking me a question before. But he said, Mom, you okay? And I looked at him and I said, Did you just ask me if I'm okay? And I was just floored. But I was seeing that he understood that this was hard for me too. And I didn't want him to be sorrowful about that. There's a lot of worry and concern that went on with his just teetering between life and death at times that we didn't know what was going to happen. And there were days that we would walk in that room to change places. And I go, he looks terrible. And he looks like he's dying. And, you know, it just hits you. And mommy would say, don't cry. Don't cry in front of him. I couldn't help it. I'd have to turn my face. But my eyes would show it when I got back into the room. And so some of those things can be easier if you have another person that can just bring you some uh, tips, some advice, something that's funny. I have to tell this, this is uh, back when I had surgery when I was young one time and it was a pretty major surgery. And my sister sat by my bed and she said, Cheryl, you've always been there for everybody else, but when they ask you if you need anything, you always say, oh, no, I'm fine. And I'm going to tell you right now, don't do that this time. When somebody asks you, you tell them something that they can do for you. 
because you deprive people of a blessing by not letting them help you. And I that never so thought about it that way. I guess in my selfish mind, I, our prideful mind, I was thinking, oh, I can't ask for help. I don't want to be helpless. And I'm, I'm still that way a lot. I, you know, it's hard for me. But it is important to let people help. And one of the funniest things that happened during that, I was down for a month or more. Two of my friends came to the door. They rang the doorbell. And when they came in, they had a toilet brush over their shoulders. And I laughed. And I said, what are you doing here? And they said, well, we know you don't feel like cleaning your toilets. But, and we know your kids are too young and mommy won't care. So we came to clean your toilets. They cleaned our toilets and left. <laughs> I would never have asked anybody to do that. But I've laughed all these years. That has got to be one of the most fun times. You know, just letting somebody share with me when I needed that. And then I had an older lady at church that said, Cheryl, now this is going to take you a little while to get well. So I want you to take care of yourself. So to help you, I'm going to come every Friday and I'm going to change your sheets. That's all she came to do. But the whole time she was helping me change sheets, she was talking to me. And she was giving me some wisdom as an older woman to me about how to better take care of myself, knowing that I had a special needs child. I had young kids. I've had surgery. And it was going to be hard to just really take care of myself with all the responsibilities. So sometimes your blessings come dressed in a different way than you think they're going to come. You know, you may expect a big package in the mail and it may be a person who walks in that just saves your day, helps you laugh, helps you get a hold of how things should be going that maybe they aren't going quite that way and they can help you see the goodness in it, help you see the blessing. Don't you think also some of the things that, happen the the smaller they are like a toilet brush some you know or are changing your sheets sometimes it's the little tiny things right. that have the most meat yes those little texts can mean the world from someone you know understands what you're going through you don't have to tell them everything you're going through they're just a caregiver too and they know what it's like and that's where being vulnerable to how difficult things get when they are hard. Maybe you have to make a choice. Does your family member need to move into assisted care and they've rebelled against it, but you can't take, do anything else. And someone can help you make that decision and say, you really don't have a choice here. So you can't just wear that as a burden. Don't put that overcoat on and wear it around. You know, it's funny mm-hmm. how no. some people can bring you blessings and some can bring you guilt. <laughs> and I had somebody in my life that I, I look back and I think she was the travel agent for guilt trips in my life. And because there was <laughs> nothing I ever did that I felt like was good enough. Don't let those people no. take you on trips you don't want to go on. And I know that's kind of a funny way to put it, but I really had to begin to laugh about it as her being a travel agent for guilt trips because it was an everyday occurrence. And so, you know, sometimes you've got those things that are hard for you. You've got to find someone that can help you lift that burden, someone to bring you joy, take you for a walk. Somebody say, come on, let's go get a Coke. Or let's go get ice cream, something that is going to lighten your day and let you just feel a little break from what's going on. Um, Let me just mention here, if I can, I have a book that's on Amazon. It's called It Takes Courage to Be a Caregiver. And it truly does take courage. It takes courage to be a caregiver. It's on Amazon. It's on Kindle. And I put that book together after a lot of interviews from people who were caring for family members with little children all the way to caring for their parents. And I tried to, in the last part of it, put some tips in there, some lists to help people think through what should I ask my parent before they forget where things are. And I I think sometimes when we're in the midst of those things, we can't think clearly. And later it's too late. They don't want to tell you. If they're in Alzheimer's, they may begin to see you as suspect. Oh, you're taking all my stuff. 
you're stealing from me or something because that goes along with it. And they, they won't trust you anymore to tell you some of those things. So when they're first starting out, just in a casual way, ask them questions about their childhood. Ask them questions about family, growing up, things you really will want to know one day. And then insert that, you know, things about where, where the important papers are stored, who has access to it. Does somebody need to sign a paper to help them take care of those papers when the time comes? And those are hard things to think about, and it's too late sometimes by the time we realize we need to know it. So that book would be helpful for somebody to get maybe for Christmas for a caregiver. And then I've also had two books that I'm in that have come out while I've been gone from home on this journey. And you can't get them on Amazon yet, but you can get them from me. And one of them is called In Her Steps, Perfection to Acceptance. And in that one, when I talked about how we try to be perfect all the time, but we can't, and it gives us frustration, or we feel like we never measure up. But we have to learn to accept ourselves and accept our imperfections and learn to just say, okay, these are my strengths. I'm going to work on my strengths instead of my weaknesses. You don't need to focus on the weakness all the time. We need to get past that and learn how, even with our children, what are they good at? Yes, they may not be able to add and subtract good, but maybe they're great at drawing in art, or they may be great at learning from somebody else. And then the oh, other book. Let, the other can book I say is, this? Yes. I, I have in my office, hanging in my office, the most beautiful picture, and it's Blake that painted it. Oh, that's, oh, how neat. Thank you. Did yes, you because. Remember? Yes, I forgot about that, Kim. You know, here's our son that we were told to put away and forget we ever had him several times when he was little. And then people have told us, just like lately, you know, he has no quality of life. Give up on him. No. We found out by a therapist who was doing art for range of motion that he could paint. And then his paintings oh. are in Houston at 14 Southern Dental Clinics, Texas A&M. And even at the University of Washington Medical School in Seattle and many other places. Wow. But, you know, he was a child. I wish that doctors could see now that they would have, that they said, forget him. He'll never learn to do anything. The other book that I want to tell you about is called In Her Shoes, A Stronger Version of Me. In Her Shoes, A Stronger Version of Me. And that one is to try to show how when we go through challenges, our challenges become our stepping stones to become stronger. And if you've never had a hardship in your life, you're not a very strong person. You've never been tested. You don't know if you can go through things. But I guess like Kim said about me early on, I've had one thing after the other all of my life that challenged me to become stronger. And many times she would tell me, you're strong. And I'd say, no, I'm not. And she'd say, yes, you are. You don't recognize it. But that's true. We need to tell each other when we see their strengths. And I try to now tell every caregiver how strong they are for going through and not giving up on their role as a caregiver. But those are just some things I can think of that, Maybe that'll help somebody. Or if you've got tips and you want to write me, I'd love, love, love to hear from you. And I also coach caregivers. I've actually got a site that's called the Overlook Caregiver that I told you about, but I'm creating lessons for companies because there are about 28 million people who are paid caregivers out there. They need some more training, even though they say, oh, I'm certified, I don't need that. Well... I'm sorry to tell you, but as a consumer, there are some things that consumers can tell you could be improved. And maybe the money is spent in the wrong place at a company that could be better spent to improve the quality instead of the um, appearance that they give of how great a job they're doing. So that's something else. Well said. Well said. Well, and you are such um, 
like you are such an an accessible leader. I think that's a really important point to make on here. If someone is listening and they need um, that connection, you are so good about being available where people can message you and say, you know, look, my child has autism. How, where do I go? And you have pointed thousands of people. And I know this, you can, you can be humble if you want to, but <laughs> I know the impact you have had on so many people to help them get directed in the right way. You know, that's the, I think that's the important part about what you're doing is, and Miss Connie addressed it while I think you were off, that you address so many things on your radio program and your books and when you go speak, all of those things because there is a listener thread of the unknown. There's a common thread of being lonesome, right? You know, being feeling alone. And you address those things, but you also are connected to so many doctors and so many experts and so many people that are able to answer some of those questions that I encourage anybody listening, if you have, you know, some kind of a, even a concern, send a message to Cheryl because she will, and she gets lots of messages. So be patient with her as well. And she's going <laughs> through a lot right now, but it does make a difference when you, when you can have someone help just point you in a direction, you know, Absolutely. you don't, I didn't know that there was a cerebral palsy foundation. You know, I didn't know there was, you know, all the different things that there are. I I've never experienced that. And so when you, come home from the hospital I think this was a conversation you and I had a long time ago but when you come home from the hospital and you have this new baby that is like not been diagnosed yet but you know that there's something wrong and you've got to figure that out I mean I just think you're such a walking resource for people to get connected in the right way and the fact that you love everybody like you love people. I do. Uh, my husband laughs. He'll, he'll see me hugging somebody we don't know, and he'll say, "Well, did you invite them home for Christmas?" <laughs> he teases exactly. me. Yeah, he teases me a lot. But you know, just like no. um, other people in the waiting rooms that we've met, we've had an impact on each other's lives because we watched other people suffering and I just get up and go over and hug them and say I'm so sorry can I hug you and I don't have to ask them what's going on I can see in their face the sorrow yeah. maybe the doctors just left the room and they break down and they just need somebody to put their arms around them at that time or say can I pray for you because that just means so much to people to know somebody somebody else cares about me besides me. Hey, Lord, I need help. I need friends <laughs> who also <laughs> pray for me. Well, when Justin died, that was one of the things that meant the most to me. It wasn't all the words that were spoken because I couldn't never even process Kim. what Kim, it never is the, the words. Yeah. When, when they came and loved on me, that was that was so impactful for me because it was like, I'm not alone. They might not even understand, but they're not leaving me to my own, like, you know, hurts. They're, right. they're, they're, they're at least there to, to hug you or to, absolutely, you know, and, and I think that's the most important lesson probably that I learned from my child passing was that, I've been able to go to a lot of other parents who have lost children now and I don't have to say anything. No. I just go and sit with them or right. I just am available. And I think that's the availability. We're all busy. I think, I think, I think you hit on something. I mean, being, making yourself available and, and approachable because right. if you're approachable, then people will feel comfortable 
And and I think by showing rather than speaking, mm -hmm. by showing that you care, by sitting next to someone or giving them a hug or or whatever it is. It, yeah, when Tom was sick, that was the the biggest impact was it wasn't the words, it was the yeah. the people that that gave a hug or had had you know let it, let me know that they were there for me and whatever I needed. Yes, right. Because you don't, know, you know, there's things that you go through that we cannot know. There's things I've been through that unless you've been in that situation, you can't know. Right. And so sometimes our opinion or our advice is the wrong thing. I can tell you, well, I think you should do this for Blake, but I don't know what to do with Blake. And so, you know, that's a, I think that, I think that the loving on you, because that's what I know how to do. I know how to love on you. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I, and that's what I have seen even with uh, going through such difficult times for the last four or five weeks that the people that uh, have impacted me, it wasn't what they said because they weren't trying to give me advice, but they were just there to hug me or to say, what's your son's name? I'll pray for him. And I've met incredible people that, you know, I just feel like I'm connected to. I don't know their names. I don't know where they live. I may never see them again, and yet we have a connection because we cared about each other. And I think sometimes people make a mistake of thinking you have to do something really big. No, you don't. Just be you and reach out to other people and be the kind of person, like you said, Connie, of being approachable because that's something a lot of people give the impression they don't want to be bothered or they don't have time or... I don't know what you're going through. I don't want to know. But it's so true what you said, Kim. The advice that people give you sometimes is so hurtful because it's the opposite of what you need to hear or it's the opposite of how you feel. And, mm -hmm. I mean, even through this, I've had people say, well, wouldn't it be better off if Blake just died? I mean, look at his life. And I'm like, they're good friends saying that to me. Don't they understand this is my child that I love dearly? His body may not be right. He may not be able to go out and have a job and support himself, but I love him. I don't want him to be put to sleep because I don't want to deal with this problem. And that's, yeah. that's the kind of uh, signals we send out to people sometimes by just saying things that we just need to hug instead of talk. <laughs> yeah, keep the, keep the lips tight and give a hug. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Well, Tim, you know, I if just, somebody wants to reach me, they can reach me by even Googling my name. It's going to be on this program, How to Spell It, Cheryl Jennings. But they can just Google me and find me everywhere. <laughs> and I have so many I different can, social media ways they can connect to me or send me an email. I'd love it. I, I put your email address in there because your name is spelled a little different, so I want to make sure they got it. So cool. I stopped. That's why I was looking down. I wasn't not paying attention. I was trying to take care of you. That's okay. <laughs> I didn't see it. I can't see that on here. But I really am <laughs> glad that you're doing this to help people who are struggling, and they may mm -hmm. not know that there's any help out there for them, but there is. And if they're there having is. trouble, yeah. just connect. And we'll help you. One of the people that's on this program, like uh, your uh, Aria, is that how you say her name? The way she said, you know, just all of us around here is givers. Anything that we can do, we wouldn't be here if we weren't giving. You know, we were here because we're open to helping with whatever situation is there. And it's not for financial gain, even though we need to earn money to support ourselves. Our first motive is, am I the right person to help you? Or can I send you to someone who is the right person to help you? So yeah, That's exactly And you are so precious. I just appreciate you so much being on here today. We are out of time, but we are, we are definitely grateful. I did put in the comments um, how to reach Cheryl through her website. That's probably 
either on Facebook or her website are probably the two best ways. I put your book title so they could go on Amazon and get that. Thank and you. I am here. You are so welcome. I am here to testify to the fact that this woman has a heart that she is such a giver and she is such a, an amazing lover of people that if you are a caregiver, don't be alone anymore. Right. Like message her and get connected and she will she will get you connected in the right places. Cheryl, thank you for being on oh. and thank you for being friends. Thank you. And thank you for being in your life as well. It's been yeah. a couple of years now, so really good wow. to, to be able to with your your journey. Well, I, and I just appreciate the work that you're both doing, and I thank you very much for asking me to be part of this and look forward to doing more with y'all. And uh, yes. you're so true. It, you know, anything we can do, we're there. And that we truly say that with absolute meaning. Well, squeeze Mr. Monty and Blake for me, and I love you. And love we you will too. see you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is the Hope to Hope Conference. That was a powerful session with Cheryl Jennings. Very. We will be back um, at noon central time with um, the, amazing, the amazing Christy Garcia. So you don't want to miss out on that. She will sparkle you up. She is um, also an amazing speaker, but I... I just can't say enough about Cheryl that no, she's that, she's somebody really special. Yeah, really, so really special. Get connected. We love you guys, and we'll see you in just a few minutes on session number three for the Hope to Hope Conference. I'm Kim White with the My Sexy Business Team. I'm Connie Myers with the Crystal Light Moments Success Movement and Crystal Light Moments Publishing. We love you guys. Bye.